deacons be seated. The Lord will faithfully speak to us now from His Word, from the Gospel of Mark. If you want to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Mark is the second book of the New Testament. If you're visiting with us, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, there are black hardback Bibles in the seat in front of you. You'll find Mark 10 on page 1006, 1006. I want to begin reading in verse 32, this extended narrative through the end of the chapter with Jesus interacting with both his disciples and then a blind man. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 32, it is written, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles." And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask that you might open our eyes to behold the wonderful truth you have revealed of yourself in your Son, that seeing your glory in his face, we might have confidence all who trust your Son are brought into your very presence by his divine person and power. We ask our Father, you would by his Spirit give us ears to hear and give us hearts united in the fear of you, you might be glorified and honored as we adore and worship you. We pray, our Father, that we would seek nothing beyond your glory and the goodness of all that you've revealed to us in yourself and in your Son, Jesus. And we pray to you in his name. Amen. The reformer Martin Luther once wrote, I am more afraid of Pope's self than of the Pope in Rome and all his cardinals. The great Baptist preacher C.H. Spurgeon similarly said, The demon of pride was born with us, and it will not die one hour before us. It is woven into the very warp and woof of our nature. And Puritan George Swinock vividly and simply just said, Pride is the shirt of the soul. It's put on first and put off last. Pride, selfish ambition, it diffuses its way into everything into our lives, and even our best works, 
and most noble ends, its pride is shot through. Pride was present on the road to the cross. Pride in the disciples demonstrated the need for which why was go- Jesus was going to Jerusalem, even though the disciples themselves couldn't see it. This section of Mark's gospel from chapters 8 to 10 is about the Lord's journey to Jerusalem to suffer and to die and to rise again as the Savior. It began back in chapter 8, verse 29, when Peter identified Jesus as the Christ. Christ means anointed one, Messiah, God's anointed ruler. And for the disciples, that immediately meant one thing and one thing only. Reign over our enemies. Remove the Romans. God's king is here. Establish the kingdom now. This is what they wanted. But Jesus evidently conceived of his kingship differently. Because right after Peter identifies him as Christ, Jesus in verse 30 of chapter 8 strictly charges them to tell no one. There would be no coronation ceremony that day for Jesus. Don't tell anybody. And then in verse 31 of chapter 8, he begins to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And Mark tells us in verse 32 of chapter 8, he said this plainly. Now, remember Mark was not the first gospel written. It was actually the last. And Mark is Peter's testimony written by the hand of of Mark. So what you have here is Peter's recollection years later that Jesus told us this, and he said it plainly. It was clear, but they didn't get it. They didn't see it. Why? Well, most basically, it's because they were still spiritually dull. Back in Mark chapter 6, verse 52, we're told that they didn't understand Jesus' miracle about the loaves because their hearts were hardened still. God had not revealed it to them. Their mind, as Jesus will rebuke Peter in chapter 8, is still set on the things of man. And that's why Jesus rebuked Peter as Satan. Because concurrent with Satan's goal is man's goal. It serves the evil one. Satan's temptation is to exalt ourselves over God. Serve yourself, forget God. Setting yourself on the things of man, not on the things of God. So even in their eagerness for the Christ, when they hear, you are the Christ, they hear it in terms of their goals and their desires, which were immediate. Get rid of our enemies. Get rid of our oppression. They wanted the excitement that they would be exalted by Jesus' exaltation. There was no category for the cross. There was no category for the ruler of God coming to die. There was no category for their need for it. And so as they go on this journey to Jerusalem, recorded in Mark 8-10, to the conversations and the necessity of the cross only deepen. In chapter 9, verse 30, for example, they go on from there through Galilee, and Jesus' explanations get more pointed. And there we're told again in verse 32, the disciples were amazed and afraid. And so they didn't understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. So they just focused on what they did understand, and they begin arguing about who is the greatest in the kingdom. Because remember, for the disciples, they're on a political campaign to Jerusalem. And what do supporters of the reigning candidate do prior to the inauguration? They barter for positions in the administration. That's what they're doing. Who's the greatest? Who gets the best positions in the coming kingdom? The king is here. Where will we be? What will be our roles? So Jesus has to explain again the kind of kingdom he's come to bring in. So if you step back, you see what's happening as Jesus and the disciples are walking to Jerusalem. 
He's walking to the cross physically, and he's leading his disciples to understand the cross spiritually. Why do they need the death that they don't understand? The Lord still does this today. Every Christian some of the time, and many professing Christians all the time, do not understand why we need Jesus and his saving work. Many, gathering this morning in visible churches, see Jesus as some tool for a greater end. He's a use for something other than what we want. Better life, better marriage, kids that turn out right, good work, sense of morality, even health. Jesus is a servant of a variety of selfish ambitions not a savior from selfishness. It explains the the growing phenomenon in wider Christian circles of pastors who own the libs, champion political causes with skyrocketing popularity, while ministers of the word and prayer are lambasted as cowards, irrelevant, checked out, because Christians still want a king for their own immediate concerns not a savior for the life to come, saving them from those very worries and anxieties themselves. How different are we at times than Peter rebuking Jesus for suggesting the cross and not giving a crown now? The truth is, sometimes, not all that much. Our expectations can be far different than our Lord's necessary mission. And the Lord Jesus exposes this and exposes our hearts with one question. And I don't know if you caught it when we read, but he asks Bartimaeus and the disciples the same question in verse 36 and verse 51 of Mark chapter 10. What do you want me to do for you? And that, beloved, is a great question to lay before our hearts this morning. What do you want Jesus to do for you? And we discover here in this passage, it's possible for a blind man to see more clearly than even the sighted disciples. I want us to split our consideration of this passage in two. We look at the disciples asking, give me glory. And then blind Barda made us begging, show me mercy. Give me glory, show me mercy. Let's consider first the request for glory. Give me glory. James and John, verse 35, sons of Zebedee, they recognize Jesus is God's king. He's the Christ. He's the ruler. And they pose a question typical for royalty. Their question in of itself is not rude. When Jesus comes into his glory as a king, they want him to do for them whatever they ask. They're asking a request Jesus, when you come into your glory, in essence, can we get some glory too? They want to be at your right hand and your left. Now, thinking about James and John, this is what they had been accustomed to. They were at his right hand and his left. Even then, these sons of Zebedee also belonged to a higher economic class and social class than the other disciples. And alongside Peter, They were the inner circle of the disciples. There was 12, but then there was the inner circle, James, John, and Peter. Uh, The Gospels record them sitting beside Jesus at meals. And they were the disciples that were taken up to the Mount of Transfiguration and given the extra privilege of seeing Christ reveal his eternal glory. So they had grown accustomed to privilege. And in essence, they're asking, this is going to continue, right? What they first received as unmerited favor, they've now come to expect, and so they're requesting it. Jesus, when you are glorified, we're getting glory too, right? In essence. Now pause right here and allow any romantic notions about the reality of Christian community or the church to be undone. The disciples are literally on the road to the cross with Jesus and their preoccupation is what's in it for me. Certainly, John Calvin was right when he said that this is a bright mirror to human vanity. 
it exposes the root of what we call sin. Sin is nearness to our Creator, our God, who has given us life, breath, and all things, and yet being preoccupied with what we think we deserve from Him, what He owes to us, and demanding it. It began with our parents in the garden, freely given life and everything but God, but wanting to be like God instead, rather than depend on His goodness. This is why everyone on earth throughout history in Adam is guilty as a sinner, even though the outward acts of sin vary radically. One writer made this remark, it is by our aims rather than by our achievements that we stand judged. It's the motivations of our hearts that expose us to the reality of us being sinners. You can donate to charity, build a hospital for children, but if your motivation is so that your name is in broad lights down Main Street on that hospital, who was it really for? It's our aims, not our achievements, that expose us. It's self-love all the way down. And this has affected everything, and it remains even among the disciples of the Lord Jesus, even as we see it here so vividly. We see that there's a very thin line between wanting to do great things for the glory of God and wanting God to glorify you because you've done great things for Him. It's a very thin line, and we cross over it easily. And it can be almost imperceptible when you cross that line. And it's not just an occupational hazard for pastors or missionaries or those in vocational ministry. It afflicts every Christian. The Sunday school teacher who demands recognition for service. The long-term member who asks another Christian, do you know who I am? I've been in rooms where that question has come out of the mouths of Christians, do you know who I am? Think about what that exposes in our hearts that we have the capacity to say that. Demanding greatness. So we ought not to read this as though James and John have made some exotic request. This is us, ugly and real. And we are often very little different and have only voiced, they've only just voiced what we wonder. And Jesus tells them explicitly in verse 38, you don't know what you're asking. Now there's no excuse up to this point because Jesus has told them, as we saw plainly three times, why they're going to Jerusalem. But they couldn't hear it. Now, with the image that Jesus uses beginning in verse 38 of cup and celebration, the the disciples were likely hearing the celebratory images of an overflowing cup of a king or the ceremonial cleansing of baptism. And what they were doing, what was so typical as we see in the Gospels, is focusing on one stream of prophecy, the triumph and victory of God's kingdom. That's absolutely true. But they were assuming that they had the right themselves to participate in it that it was owed to them, that they deserved it. But in the Old Testament, the Lord does not just use these images of a cup and being submerged of victory, but also of judgment. For example, in Isaiah 51, verse 17, it says of Jerusalem's judgment, wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. With the cup I drink... Jesus, in verse 38, refers to the cup of God's judgment, the cup of wrath poured out in judgment. And to be baptized is to be be immersed, to be submerged by the waters of justice, which is pervasive in the Old Testament of judgment as waters flooding the earth, even literally with Noah. Again, Isaiah is one example. Isaiah 30, verse 27, Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, Burning with his anger, his breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches up to the neck. Judgment comes and submerges the guilty. But they haven't been paying attention. Even in verse 33 of this chapter, notice Jesus says that he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. Literally, to the nations. Why? Because in the Old Testament, when God judged Israel, he handed them over to the nations. 
and the exile and the encouragement and the invasion to them. Everywhere here, Jesus is indicating divine judgment all over the place. I am going to Jerusalem to suffer judgment, to suffer the judgment of God. He's being handed over to the nations to drink the cup of his father's wrath, to be submerged in judgment. And the disciples say, verse 39, dude, we're totally able. Easy. I'll drink that cup of victory, no problem. They have no idea what's going on. They didn't see it. They don't get it. Because when the time comes for the Lord Jesus to drink that cup in the Garden of Gethsemane, what does he pray? Take this cup from me. And when he's handed over to the nations, and when he's baptized in the Father's judgment, who's on his right and his left? Two criminals dying on crosses with him. They have no idea what they're asking. But we are able They don't understand what they're saying. But Jesus assures them, notice in verse 39, you will drink and you will be baptized. Now, of course, they would not suffer divine justice like Jesus as a substitute, as the perfect God-man, but they would participate in his suffering as his disciples. James and John would follow Jesus' path to glory. James would be beheaded as a martyr in Jerusalem. John exiled to Patmos, both suffering for Christ. And the early church, the first Christians, would use baptism to speak of the martyrs because their faith had been baptized by blood. They literally identified with Christ. The disciples in the early church couldn't fathom a cross of gold around your neck as some ornament. It was was shameful and cruel and agonizing. To take up a cross meant self-denial and death. And that's what they're called to do. And Jesus makes plain, you will follow this path. Jesus went to the cross to save us from the justice for the arrogant assumption that we don't deserve justice. Jesus went to the cross to bear the fruit of his disciples walking the same pattern of life. And they would. Now, if we're tempted to indict James and John, notice verse 41, that the others are just as indignant, that they'd snuck ahead of them. They're just as jealous and ambitious for their own glory as the sons of Zebedee. Notice here, no one among Jesus' closest companions on earth have even begun to consider or think about the gravity of what he's saying. He's repeating, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer judgment. And nobody's thinking about it. They're all thinking of themselves. James and John are thinking of themselves. And then the other disciples are mad that James and John thought of themselves before they thought of themselves. And it's an entire just chaos of political jockeying for position. The pride of the disciples is exposed vividly the pride of our own hearts. And this kind of jockeying will continue in the church. It's in the New Testament. Remember Philippians. Paul writes from prison in Philippians 1, verse 15. Some preach Christ from envy and rivalry. They proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. Some preach Christ from selfish ambition. You see, Paul was arrested, so now he was sidelined and discredited by his rest. So it was a time to make a move for his platform. It was time to get glorified by God. It's the same thing going on here. The road to Jerusalem continues with pride as the shirt of the soul. So what does Jesus do as the good shepherd? He shepherds his disciples and he points out, beginning in verse 42, how the Gentile rulers behave the way they behave, that they're exhibiting the very pride that they despise in others that is shot through in humanity. They use their authority to lord it over others and to exercise authority over them. Now, Jesus, throughout his ministry, affirms the fifth commandment to honor parental authority, the most basic fundamental precept of authority in existence. He affirms the role of government, 
that it's been appointed by God, as does the rest of the Bible. So Jesus here, he's not advocating for some kind of turning human society, society into an egalitarian commune, where there's no roles, no hierarchy. It's all over the Bible and in the church. So what is Jesus getting to when he says, talks about the rulers that lord it over and their great ones exercise authority? Well, let's think about how his disciples came to understand that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, Paul picks this up and he writes this, I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. Here, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, we refrain from coming for church discipline. That's real authority. But not to lord it over. The point of that and the point, the reason he brings that up is is to serve their joy in the faith. That is, the real authority the apostle has was given to serve their security in the faith, not serve Paul's fame and the recognition of his own authority. Or let's take Peter. Peter who was there. Peter who picks up the same idea again in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. And Peter exhorts elders there and says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering or lording over those in your charge, but by being examples to the flock. Again, real authority, oversight, shepherding, But why? To exemplify Christ, not enjoy exaltation by men. Right? The point here that Jesus is making to his disciples is not that there's no such thing as authority in life anymore, or even in Christ's church. The point is, what are those positions for? What's the motivation for those in them? How is it to be used, in other words, Jesus is illustrating for his disciples that their positions of prominence to be near the Christ is ministerial. It's to serve, not magisterial, not to rule, or not to puff up their own profiles or egos because of who they are. That's how, as Jesus explains, that's how the Gentiles live and hold position. Why do the Gentiles want to be rulers? To serve the common good? No, to be exalted, to be lifted up over others. Now remember, this is why the disciples want Jesus to run the Romans out. They hate the Gentile rulers and the Romans who are continually oppressing them and lording it over them. And notice how Jesus, as the skillful physician of the soul, he pulls his disciples aside and says, the very boot that grinds you and that you hate is in your own heart, and you just want the same thing. He's pointing out that what they experience in the world is present in themselves. He has to teach his disciples again. Their hearts are really no different Implicitly, Jesus is asking them, do you really want God's kingdom where his will is done on earth as it is in heaven? Or do you just want to be in charge of a different kingdom of men so that you can now rule over your, those who hate you? Jesus here is explaining how completely different is his kingdom. In his kingdom, those who are great must be servants. Those who are first must be slaves. Being great or first is not found in the recognition of others. It's found in serving them for God's glory. Now, grasp what the Lord is saying here. He is not saying that if you're humble for a little bit, put in your time, then you'll get a chair of glory. Oh, he's not saying that. He's reversing their evaluation of greatness altogether. Serving is greatness. First rank belongs to the first servant. He's saying that greatness is evaluated in my kingdom, in God's kingdom, on an entirely different scale. And how that's possible, he explains in verse 45, an incredibly pregnant sentence. He is the Son of Man. 
Now, that's not just a statement of his true humanity. It's a prophetic title. It comes out of Daniel 7. The kingdom of God is coming with the Son of Man. It speaks of God's coming king. Jesus is affirming, yes, I'm the Christ. I'm the king. I'm he. But God's king would come to die first. And Jesus essentially, for the rest of this verse, riffs off Isaiah 53, verse 12. Isaiah 53, verse 12 reads, He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Literally, he gives his soul, bears the sin of many. Jesus is saying, yes, I am the king, and the king and the suffering servant that Isaiah promised, they're the same one. They're me, the Christ. And if he does not ransom the proud, then they have no claim upon his kingdom. Jesus had come to pay the ransom for sinners. He, the perfect son of God, who deserved no justice, the only man who's ever walked the earth that that could be said of. But yet he came to drink a cup of wrath that is not filled with any sin for his own. He was submerged under a justice he didn't deserve, and he did it for many, that the judgment that fall, fell on him would not be theirs, but that they would belong to him and his Father. If you trust the Lord Jesus, the many means you. The Son of Man, Christ, came to serve you and give his life in your place. Trust Jesus. Rest in him. Be rescued from the justice that you and I deserve by nature. Jesus here is walking to Jerusalem to pay the debt his disciples owe and that they exhibit even as they're bickering in sin on the way to the cross. Jesus is going to the cross to liberate his disciples from the very sin they're exhibiting on the road there and to even liberate them from its very power. Jesus' instruction isn't over. We see, secondly, show me mercy. And the contrast between the disciples grasping for glory, give me glory, to a beggar begging, show me mercy. They approach Jericho on their way to Jerusalem, moving toward it, and a blind beggar, Bartimaeus, is sitting along the side of the road. He hears the excitement around him that it was Jesus, so he cries out. But he's rebuked. Now, the blind and disabled in this day were treated as outcasts. It was taken for granted if you would have seen someone with some kind of physical disability that obviously they'd been cursed by God. They had done something or someone in their family had done something, and so they deserved it. And compassion was very, very short. And so he's being told, basically, be quiet. But Bartimaeus cries out even more, and notice he cries out, son of David. Now, blind Bartimaeus is the only one in Mark's gospel who uses that title, that Jesus is the one to receive the eternal kingdom promised to David's line. Bartimaeus gets it. Daniel 7, 2 Samuel 7. He gets it, and he knows it's Jesus. He's the Christ. He's the one to come. He's the Son of Man. He's the Son of David. He gets it. And Jesus then calls him over, and notice 50, verse 50, he throws off his cloak. Now, now, why that detail? That's probably all he had. A cloak would have been his greatest possession during the day, opened on the ground to collect gifts and alms at night, wrapping him up in warmth. He is literally casting off all his earthly goods. And then in verse 51, he gets the same question that James and John got in verse 36. Now, it may seem obvious to us what he might want to ask for, but think about it. Maybe Bartimaeus wanted money. Maybe he wanted power and vengeance over all the people who have mistreated him in his life. Maybe he wanted to be at the right hand so that he could deal out some judgment when the kingdom came. All those people, the people who had just told him to shut up when he was right about Jesus. But what does he say? He just wants mercy. 
he wants, verse 51, to see. And by faith, Bartimaeus is transformed. And he testifies to the power of Jesus to give sight to the blind. Not only does he recover his sight, but with open eyes, he doesn't return to his life. Jesus says, go your way, but he doesn't go his way. Where does he go? He goes on the way following Jesus. He's done living for himself. He's now following the son of David, God's king, who's just demonstrated his very identity by giving him sight. He abandons everything to follow Jesus on the way to the cross. Do you see the parallel and instruction that the Lord lays out for us? James and John want to ensure what's in it for them as they go to Jerusalem. Bartimaeus throws off his cloak and just follows him. James and John are already seated next to Jesus and they want to sit on thrones in glory with him. Bartimaeus doesn't care where he sits. He knows he's a beggar, but he doesn't ask for money, only mercy. And in Jesus, he found mercy. So he followed him to the cross without rebuking Jesus for where they're going. There's a blind man in Jericho who saw more clearly than disciples with Jesus. And if he has power to restore sight to the blind, that must be there's a Savior with power to give sight to the blind, even blind disciples blinded by selfish ambition. You see, what James and John are to see and what we're all to see in Jesus' interaction with Bartimaeus is what they need is mercy from Jesus for their pride, for their selfishness, for their callous disregard, for everything else that flowers from the root of sin within them. They need mercy. And Jesus has the power to give it. Even to you. What do you want Jesus to do for you? What's your answer? Glory or mercy? Most of us were raised to assume that the worst thing that could ever happen to you is your self-esteem gets too low. It's interesting, in the 19th century, J.C. Ryle gave this warning. Let all who desire to please Christ watch and pray against self-esteem. Above all, let all who desire to walk in Christ's steps Labor to be useful to others. The worst thing that can happen to us is not that our self-esteem takes a hit as hard as that can be at times. The worst thing that can happen is that we are left alone with only our self-esteem and the selfish ambition that keeps us from God. Christ came to liberate us from the power and penalty of seeking ourselves. Is that what you want Jesus to do for you? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your love, the saving mission of your Son, the gentleness with which he shepherds our hearts and exposes the reality there, but does not flee from its ugliness, but seeks to draw us to you that we might be healed and sanctified and redeemed in your mercy. We thank you for the blood of the Son of Man who covers the sin of all who trust him, that we might in your presence confess honestly the sin that remains and expect and hope in your sanctifying power and eternal glories with you forever. Our Father, we pray you would help us to walk all the more contritely and humbly before your majesty, knowing that what we deserve from you is justice, but yet what we have gotten from you is mercy and grace by your love. Help us, Father, to beg more for mercy that we might know you and that you might be glorified and exalted in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.